We are going to get started. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for our conversation today with Scott Goodman and Jim Reynolds. We're so thrilled that you're here to tune in for our Real Estate Forum event. Um, our Real Estate Forum is sponsored in part by JLL, and they're our wonderful partners um, on this endeavor. So before we kick off the conversation for today, I'm going to introduce our Real Estate Forum chair, Meredith O'Connor from JLL, to begin with some opening remarks. Thanks, Megan. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual Real Estate Forum, the future of Michael Reese Hospital Opportunity Zones in Chicago. I'm Meredith O'Connor, International Director at JLL and Chair of the Executives Club Real Estate Forum. I'm excited to welcome you for a lively discussion focusing on opportunity zones in Chicago and specifically what's going on at the former Michael Reese Hospital site. We hope you, we can keep your video on during this event and be active in our speakers' conversation. If you would like to be more focused on this view of the event, please put your Zoom in speaker mode located at the top right-hand corner of your screen. We are thrilled to feature Christian Bodwan, who's our Managing Director and Research Lead at JLL for today's moderator. He will be leading the discussion with Scott Goodman, the Founder and Principal at Farpoint Development, as well as with Jim Reynolds, the Founder, Chairman, and CEO of Loop Capital. Before I get started, I'm going to show you a few ways to interact with us throughout the event we encourage you to ask questions and chat with your fellow attendees during the session. Here's how you can do this. So we encourage you to use the chat fe feature throughout the discussion to share thoughts with your fellow participants. We will also have time for the audience questions at the end of the meeting. To ask a question, please use the raise your hand feature and you will be called on when it is your turn. The raise your hand button can be found by hovering over your mouse on the participants button and a taskbar will appear like the one you see on the screen. Thanks again for joining us today and thank you to our speakers for sharing your insight with, on such an exciting topic. Christian, over to you. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks again for the introduction and, and thanks also for all of your leadership with the Executives Club in Chicago. It's truly appreciated and we're glad to be a part of it at JLL. Jim and Scott, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for being here today. I know that you are both very busy and we're all very busy, so your, your time is much appreciated. Uh, but I think let's start by leveling the playing field a little bit uh, because not everybody in the audience might be familiar with Opportunity Zones, how this project fits in, what's happening in Chicago. By our count, uh, I had a research team look into this. There are 327 Opportunity Zones in Illinois. But can you give us just a general update about the status of OZs in Chicago? What are your perceptions of the program so far? What's happening in Opportunity Zone? Uh, I'll Jim, let you want to off and then I'd love to, to uh, pick it up after we yeah. kick. Perfect. Uh, Meredith and Christian, thank you so much for having us. Uh, obviously a huge honor and uh, even more so to be on the panel with Jim. So, so thank you guys very much. Um, you know, opportunity zones, you know, the buzzword of uh, the last couple of years uh, in Chicago. Chicago was very, uh, it was more responsible than most in terms of designating those areas that are um, qualified opportunity zones. Uh, but I think what um, we've come to learn is that an opportunity zone doesn't make a bad deal a good deal. And um, the underlying uh, value and, and value creation has to be there. Um, as probably most of you know, um, I won't go into the nuance too much, but it really requires a 10 year hold period uh, and a, uh, an investment uh, uh, equal to the amount of, of basis in the property. So there's a, a, a lot of kind of nuance that goes with it. Um, we think uh, the micro Reese site, it, it's probably the premier, it could be the premier opportunity zone of the country. It, it's just, you know, to have this kind of acreage uh, on the lakefront next to the largest convention center in the Western Hemisphere to be so close to downtown uh, in, in, a, in a, essentially a, a fallow piece of dirt so nobody's displaced. It, it's just the perfect opportunity zone. Uh, so it will help us over the long term, especially as we want to attract uh, young companies because um, the opportunity zone legislation really uh, benefits the investor of these startups the most. And, um, uh, you know, so to get people to invest where they might not have otherwise invested geographically, that's what they're working for the best. I think in Chicago, the opportunity zones, uh, the investment volume has probably been less um, than was anticipated, but I think it'll probably accelerate as, as time goes on. 
you know, and Kristen, I'll add to what Scott has said, just as a general um, observation, op opportunity zones in general have not done what they were designed to do. Um, what they have become is sort of more or less real estate plays in and around the zones. But what they were designed to do was have investment come into certain communities and neighborhoods and create operating companies, businesses. And that's been the letdown. When you think about what we're doing at the Michael Reese site, it really kind of uh, defines, I think, what Washington DC had in mind when they created the zones. Because we're gonna take, as Scott said, just dirt, it's just dirt. It's empty, it's not displacing anybody. Uh, we're gonna create uh, an amazing development in two phases, and we're gonna create jobs and operating companies, businesses in that area. And I think that that really is, is a big difference. And so Chicago will, and if this one will probably be one of the leading opportunity, opportunity zones in the country, given what I said we're going to do. And, and I think that epitomizes what the intent was with the legislation. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Jim. I completely agree with you. I think what many people have observed is that opportunity zones have been good opportunities for some investors. They've been less of good opportunities for communities and for neighborhoods and for jobs. So we're excited to hear about what you're, what you're doing at this project. Let's talk about that. Actually, let's get into the details of your specific project at, at the Michael Reese site. Can you describe for us just the vision of the project, the overall transformative nature of what you're trying to accomplish here? And Jim, maybe we'll start with you. What is the overall goal on your side for this project? You know, it's interesting, and uh, Scott's going to give you uh, probably a, a really strong view. It's, it's his, he's, the, he's the brain thrust of this effort, and he's done an amazing creative job with it. I actually, as I'm preparing for this, I took another drive around that site yesterday. Um, that location of that site, right at 26 to 31st Street, right at Lake Park to King Drive, right butting up against the lake, it is probably the most attractive undeveloped land in the city of Chicago right now. And so when we think about what we're going to do there and what we're going to put there, which is the life science, uh, basically development, also the brainchild of Scott, I think it's tremendous. And we'll talk more about why life science and health and health benefits as we proceed in the call. But also one of the things I'm going to make sure that, that we do, and Scott's incredibly receptive, I wanna thank Alderman King. When we talk, talk about the transformative nature of this project, it, it's nuanced in a lot of different areas and we can't lose sight of it. Um, that's an African-American community. It's the South side of Chicago. It butts up against Prairie Shores, which may be 100% African-American or somewhere pretty darn close to it and the neighborhood may be 80 to 90% African-American. And so when I think about the transformative nature of what we're gonna do, when we think about the massive, a three, three and a half billion dollar project, I think about the transformative nature of what we're gonna do with African-American companies, businesses, jobs, job skills, training, and their engagement and involvement with this site. So not only are we gonna create an amazing development, but the amount of African-American engagement actually working there um, is going to be tremendous as well. And it will be transformative for those businesses. It will probably be, uh, as, as Scott and the team, the GRIT team executes it, um, the most transformative for African-American businesses ever in the city of Chicago. So we're pr I'm pr very excited about that. Yeah, and just to add on to what Jim's saying is, you know, this site, you know, it's between the former Michael Reese site, um, you know, the Martian, the Martian Yard site, which uh, belongs to the MPEA uh, and some other land that we're going to add to it around, you know, it'll, it'll be in excess of, a, of 100 acres of developable land uh, next to, uh, you know, next to a major downtown area, you know, it, it just shouldn't be available for development like this uh, in 2021. So. Uh, and then when you just talk about the community of which it's a part of, you know, I think that, you know, there's there's a really interesting continuum of, of history here. Um, you know, starting out that the hospital was first built in the 1880s, um, money donated by Michael Reese, uh, a, a real estate developer from San Francisco, who whose family couldn't get health care because of their religious background. And he donated the money, uh, you know, it was a little flawed at the time, but over time to 
be accessible to everybody, race, creed, color, you know, re regardless of, of who you are. You wanted to have equitable health care for everybody. And that was really a lot of the thinking uh, that, that, that was the, the genesis for uh, what we're calling the healthy community of the future. And, um, you know, when, when we say that, you know, um, actually uh, go down a couple slides here. Um, just want to, this is, I'll come back to this in a second, but um, this one here. So, uh, you know, these are, these are our guiding principles for, for everything we're doing on this site. You know, we, we, we look to see what social determinants of health really mean, right? And it's, it's much more than just healthcare. It's, it's, you know, you, you need to be secure and you need to have a place for recreation and certainly job training and, and accessibility to jobs, you know, your shelter and, and how you live and where you live and with whom you live and uh, the community around you and, 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 and how you interact with people. Um, you know, this, this neighborhood, uh, obviously home to the great migration as well. Uh, you know, and we've taken a close look at all the cultural um, thing, you know, whether it's the birth of the blues or gospel or jazz or so many other things in the neighborhood, uh, we, we look to honor those as, as we go forward. And, and, and just, you know, equity of, of dignity and, and access and, and a just society. Um, we're taking close look at the way people move around on the site, uh, the way food is both delivered uh, and, and available. And lastly, um, uh, the way the, the grounds and the, and the ecosystem work to work together with that. And, um, you know, our, our first our first phase will include um, the building that's up the left hand corner here, which is the Arc Innovation Center, Chicago Arc Innovation Center, which is really uh, coming about as a partnership with Shiva Medical Center, which is uh, the number nine ranked uh, medical center in the world. And uh, they're putting their their Arc Innovation Center, which is a, a research uh, accelerator uh, and incubator building. Um, It'll be a half a million square feet. It'll also uh, include a uh, welcome, uh, the Brownsville, we haven't named yet, but, but basically the community welcoming center. Um, and it'll be just the pillar and the front door to our, to our development. Um, and the idea here is to create access to all, not just, this isn't gonna be a gated community. This is meant to be an expansion of the entire Brownsville community as we move forward. So, um, you know, this healthy community of the future uh, is, is the backbone and in, in, in every, every, every decision we make is, is based on that, uh, that thinking. No, it's fantastic context, I think, to get us started. And you describe ARC and the ARC Innovation Center as sort of the anchor and sort of the first tenant. Do you plan more of a health campus kind of spreading out around that? Or do you, uh, what other components do you really specifically want to be involved in this project as it grows? Yeah, I think that if you think about it holistically, you know, the this whole healthy community, you know, doesn't mean just a life science center, right? This is going to be, you know, our first phase again, based on input from the community. There'll be a, a, a senior housing facility here. Uh, the she, the um, I'm sorry, the uh, Singer Pavilion, the only property, the only building still left on the property, about a 70,000 square foot, the former psych center. Uh, you know, hopefully we're not crazy here and there's no significance to that, but this, the, the Singer Pavilion will be uh, converted into um, the, the greenest building on the planet. We. We've, we've looked uh, globally to develop our team. So uh, in a, just to, to talk about the team, because this is a team sport and, and we think it's what really differentiates our mega development from you know, really any other one in the city is, is the team sport. So the team starts out with the city, um, with the Alderman's office. Alderman King has, has put together the Micro Reese um, uh, Advisory Council, which has worked with us the entire uh, way here and, and, and have had a tremendous amount of input on what we're doing. Uh, the mayor's office, the, the department of planning, um, again, the MRAC, as I mentioned, you know, crucial parts. Um, but before that, the grid team, and, and, and of which um, Farpoint and Loop Capital are part of, but it also uh, in, includes uh, Draper and Kramer, who own the property next door. Uh, but CNI is uh, Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives, you know, the, the group uh, responsible for all the development in Pullman and beyond, uh, a hugely impactful not-for-profit developer, uh, McLaurin Development, an African-American uh, African owned development firm, and then the um, Brownsville Community Development Partnership, um, a, a local CDC. So together, you know, as a team sport, solving a problem for the city, you know, this when the city bought this for the Olympics, which you might have heard didn't happen, um, 
you know, they were stuck with the problem and, and not just a vacant piece of land in a strategic, strategic area, but also uh, laden with debt, you know? So together uh, we get to be right in the crosshairs of, of the right side of history. So we're gonna be creating jobs in a, in a, in a responsible way, you know, involving the community. We, we are committed to 65% to, um, uh, minority participation on all, all levels of involvement on this property. Um, you know, invest Southwest with the, with the mayor's office, uh, again, with the pandemic and, and, and doing healthcare related things. So we, we, we think we are maybe the most respo socially responsible, uh, most engaged in community standpoint uh, project anywhere right now. We're very proud of that. You know, I'll, I'll yeah, add, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, please, I'll, no. I'll add quickly uh, to what Scott said. Um, if you look at all the major developments in the city of Chicago, none have any significant African-American equity participation. That's important because if, you don't, if you're not involved in the equity, you're not involved in the decision-making and you kind of don't really matter because you're not putting up any money and money really, really matters in real estate development. Uh, here, we've got three uh, equity participants that are African-American. You've got myself, uh, Luke Capital, You've got Paula Robinson and you've got Zeb McLaurin, three. And we're probably the only team that has three significant African-American investment uh, partners. And I think that's a very, very, very big deal. Uh, like I said, we're at the table, we're engaged in every single decision and that matters. When you think about the, the significance of this location and what's happening in that community, I, I, I reflect on a breakfast I was in with the um, Dean of the Medical uh, center from University of Chicago, Dean Polanski, and a few years ago, and he asked me a question, he, and he said, Jim, where do you think the sickest population in America resides? My first response was, you know, some very rural, Louisiana, rural Louisiana, rural Mississippi, Appalachia, you know, rural Georgia. He told me the south and west sides of Chicago, African Americans on the south and west sides of Chicago are some of the sickest people in the United States. Diabetes, heart disease, obesity, asthma, cancers, high blood pressure, stroke, they all get them at a higher rate than, than the national averages. One of the significance of putting a life science development here on the South Side in an African-American community is that we're gonna be addressing a lot of those issues right there where they need to be addressed. And I'm very excited about yeah, I think it's a fantastic point, uh, Jim, and, and both being a uh, Chicago resident and with my family all from uh, rural Louisiana, I know the health issues uh, very well on both sides. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> but no, I, 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 see, I see both sides and you're absolutely right. Um, but so you talked about the equity position and how critical that is. Let's also talk about the entry level jobs at this site, construction jobs. What are you doing in terms of hiring and job training in the community? Well, Scott, if you don't mind, I'll lead off with this one. Um, one of the things that Alderman King and also Samir and the mayor have been very, very focused on with Chicago, uh, with the leverage that they have uh, on Chicago land, um, is what are you going to really do for the community? As you know, Chris, been through the years, developers have come in and developed a lot of things and, and not left much of a good sense and good feeling in the community. We're going to have uh, internships, we're going to have job training, real job training. Uh, we're going to have billions of dollars of economic impact in and around the community. And so the young people are uh, really looking to get skills, uh, both in the trades and finance and retail, whatever it is, they're going to have a chance to work and acquire those skills here. There will be a school and they will be able to attend um, without a charge. Uh, and, and learn the skills. So we actually are going to invest in the community and generations, but we're also gonna have opportunities for the businesses in that community to come in and occupy some of the retail space and, and really to grow the businesses and transform those as well as the construction companies, engineering companies, technology companies and all that. So we expect all the way from the early training years 
to the businesses and, and the vendors and contractors, this is really gonna have a, a transformative impact on the community. So. Scott, I'll, uh, I'm sure I left out some stuff that you, you might want to. No, you did great. No, that's that's all true. And you know, it's uh, you know, we we, it's very intentional. You know, uh, we 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 have um, you know, uh, uh, Sierra Sierra Boatwright from CNI and also, uh, Morgan Malone uh, uh, and the Far Point team uh, working on this on a daily basis, uh, engaging, um, everybody, uh, you know, community wide uh, to make sure this is a successful program. We've uh, retained SkillSmart, which is run by Jason Green, who was in the Obama administration, who uh, is helping us uh, promote and, and, and monitor uh, all, all the jobs, all the job opportunities, all the um, um, contracting um, opportunities. So this will be a, uh, a full-time uh, endeavor and, and, and concentration of what we're doing. Fantastic. One other point I wanted to talk about for this project is sustainability. It, to me, it's a bit of a buzzword these days, sometimes in some projects without much real action. But how are you proposing to incorporate sustainability in the project the, from the perspective of not just the environment, but also the community and the city at large? Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's a, a, a big question, right? And, and something, again, we're focusing on, you know, and when I talk about team sport, you know, we started out by doing, a, you know, bringing a couple of teammates uh, that are globally renowned on our team. Uh, the first one is Walter Hood of the Hood Design Studio from the Bay Area, actually. He's an African-American landscape architect, uh, schooled at the Chicago uh, Art Institute, as it turns out. Um, and, 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 you know, the way uh, he has designed our our storm and, and wastewater treatment on site, for example, is, you know, and to create bioswales and to create uh, just ecosystems and ecotones and, and, and to really um, make this the most uh, um, self-sustaining site, you know, in the city for sure, and a model globally as well. You know, another teammate is Jason McLennan, who is the McLennan Desi Design Studio. He's actually out of Bainbridge, uh, Washington, uh, just outside of Seattle. Um, and, and he is the author of the Living, Living Building Challenge, which puts LEED certification on steroids. You know, he, uh, you know, he, he, has, he designed the Bullet Building in, in Seattle, which is a fully carbon, I think it's carbon positive. Um, um, there's a waiting list to get into the building, into an office building. You ever hear of that these days? Uh, he also, with Jeff Bezos, uh, designed the Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle, which will be the first carbon neutral sports arena in the world. Uh, he is working with us on, on every, every aspect of the site. Um, again, I mentioned that the Singer Pavilion in particular uh, will be um, literally the greenest building on the planet. And, and, and that's what we intend to do with that. It will be a model, uh, something that, you know, as a city, we're gonna be proud of. Um, Beyond that, we are forming partnerships with companies like Johnson Controls and, 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 and others who will help us uh, monitor and have sensors around the site to, to monitor water and air, air quality. And, and each of the buildings will, will, will have you know, that as well. Uh, the entire site will be a smart grid and a microgrid. So we will uh, look, look to create energy on our site and you know, working with um, you know, hopefully with like McCormick Place to, to create a, a district-wide microgrid, which will, uh, again, be the most efficient uh, in the city and in a model going forward. It's fantastic. It, it, it's, it's helpful context, I think, because as I mentioned, sustainability is so often talked about, but uh, sometimes not really put into action and developments. And so your specific plans are, are helpful. But let, you've also mentioned a couple other projects in the city. Let's discuss this site relative to some other large developments? Because you guys have a bold vision here, but, but you're not alone. So how do you propose to have this development working with, or maybe competing with, some of the others in the neighborhood as well? One Central is a large scale development just nearby. The 78 is another huge development just nearby. What, you, what are your plans in terms of coordination with them? Or how do you think this site is really unique relative to the others? Yeah, so again, the first thing I wanna mention is what makes us the most unique is that we're a team. Right, the other ones are kind of being done one-off developments, you know, uh, not in a very inclusive way. You know, again, you know, DEI, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is is what we're focused on here, and our team shows it. Right, so that's the first thing is we're doing this as a team sport. Secondly, um, 
you know, groups like uh, uh, One Central um, and the 78, we, you know, we are in constant discussion with them. You know, we, the, the, you, you mentioned the, call, the uh, QOZ, the Qualified Opportunity Zones before. Well, at the 78, for example, with DPI, you know, that's mostly an academic kind of institution there. So there'll be a lot of early stage ideas that come out of that. Well, when those companies grow up, they should come over to our site uh, as part of the QOZ where their investors can benefit um, from the legislation. And, and you know, as long-term investors, all the value that's created by those young startup companies uh, will be done in a tax advantage way. So that's that's a huge way that we can work together. Um, at One Central, and, and again, in, in coordination with McCormick Place uh, and the proposed transportation hub there, that is the perfect way to connect our site um, better to McCormick Place, better to One Central, over to the 78. And, and you know, guess what? I mean, we have the largest convention center in the, in the Western Hemisphere. We have one of the busiest airports and you can't get from one to the other. So this whole transportation hub idea, we think is fantastic. We, 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 uh, we want to speak with one voice with that and support it uh, citywide. We think it'll be great. Um, uh, so, you know, again, when we did the GRID, um, the GRID name, you know, which is the Global Research Innovation and Tourism District, um, you know, we also like to say that stands for Get Ready, It's Time, because that's, that's how we feel about the South Side here. And, and you know, we, we, once we start putting together our site, McCormick Place, One Central, and, and the 78, uh, we think the South Side will be unstoppable. And, and I'll add, Christian, just particularly as it pertains to One Central, uh, Scott and I just recently had a call with Bob Dunn, the, the, the lead developer of One Central. Those projects really butt against each other, and they're very complementary. There is no conflict. Um, and so we sat and we talked about how it is that we should, um, as we look at the city, and if you're a master planner for the city and you're thinking about how the South Side lays out, if you're in the mayor's office, you're not thinking of one central and Michael Reese site. It's really that Lake Shore Drive continuum and how they complement each other and the impact that they have to the city, to the communities and et cetera. When we think about the focus of one central, which is really a transportation hub, linking the museums and linking the institutes together and really getting folks to that part of downtown from all parts of the city, it's very complementary to what we're doing on the other side. Um, One Central has a, a robust job training program. It's going to be an additional transportation hub, a lot of retail, a lot of office space and those sorts of things. And we need to make sure that we're complementing each other as, as they go about doing that, which is Scott and I met with Bob uh, we continue to stay in touch with them. And, and, and these projects will probably wind up complementing each other very nicely. They are different, but very complementary. That's great to hear. I, I think it's important that, that you have that mindset, right? Because the South Side needs multiple projects, right? Exactly. If you really think about it, it needs transit access, it needs job creation, uh, it needs healthcare focus. So it, it's, it's not an either or, I think. And your approach seems to be really smart. And uh, you can work together with some of these large scale developments so that everyone benefits. Um, you know, another question before we turn, you know, transition over to some of the, the guest and uh, visitor questions. How are you guys assessing that market demand right now in a post COVID world? I, I, you know, do this stuff for a living, but market feasibility is very difficult to understand in a post-COVID world. Scott, are you taking any different approach to understanding absorption, space demand, cost pricing, consumer behavior, or anything, now that we're in an entirely new world? Yeah, I think the, the big distinguish, distinguishing factor there is we're creating the demand, right? The, our, our partnership with Sheba, again, if, if, if I was saying to this group, hey, Mayo's coming to town and they're going on our site, or hey, Cleveland Clinic is going to our site here, I think there'd be a lot of excitement. Well. Sheba is in the same discussion. They are, those are the number one and two rank. You know, Sheba is number nine ranked in the world. You know, if you look at what they were able to accomplish during the COVID pandemic, you would see just an incredible amount of innovation. I can't remember if they said they had 47 or uh, I think 47 different patents that came out of this, this COVID stuff. And, and the fact that they are willing to come to our site, plant their flag as their second physical ARC. And, and ARC is a, um, it's an acronym which stands for Accelerate, Redesign, and Collaborate, which is uh, how they look at, at, at um, 
at the bioscience field. Um, you know, when we when we saw the C collaborate, you know, that was perfect word for our vocabulary, right? That's exactly what we're doing on this entire site. And when and when we start building this this Arc Innovation Building, um, they are already you know telling us who they're going to attract as partners. And we another interesting thing about our site is how we are centrally located um, between you know like University of Chicago and Hyde Park and and, and IIT and Rush and Northwestern and, and all these medical institutions which are leaders in the world. Uh, and it's time for us all to get together really under one roof or in one neighborhood and, 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 and collaborate with each other and start sharing information in a way that hasn't been done in the past. So when it comes to how we build our buildings, we're gonna build them a little bit differently. Uh, in terms of demand, you know, there's been no office market on between 31st and 26th Street on, on the lake before. We're gonna create that. And we're going to do it by creating an ecosystem, um, not like Boston, not like San Francisco, but in a way that, that will really redefine the way uh, health access and health equities are, are, are delivered. And, and Kristen, I'll add, you know, investment is coming back into real estate development. Um, I mean, developers, investors are thinking about a post-COVID uh, world, and we're getting closer and closer to it particularly in projects that have outdates before coming online. Phase one here is, you know, 2021 to 2026. So we're able to kind of monitor uh, how we bring it online, monitor the market demand, the vitals around this COVID-19. But we think that we're going to have a very successful development here with the demand characteristics, the way we've outlined it over, over, the, over the time frame that we have in mind from 21 to 26. And so COVID has not stopped development, particularly in the out years. It's just, you know, you factor it in, but you continue to make your investments. Yeah, one thing I just want to add to Christian too, is that this is a mixed use development, right? So once we finally get, uh, you know, get the, the gateway to the marshalling yards done, you know, we think over over the next 15, or year, 15 years or so, you know, we'll do 12 to 15 million square feet of stuff here. The first phase, will be this Arc Innovation Center building, a senior housing that was really dictated as a demand by, by the, the MRAC, by the advisory committee, um, the senior pavilion and also a data center, uh, all part of the first phase, which will make our site extremely relevant moving forward. But over time, we'll have multifamily, we will have hospitality, we'll have uh, Cottage Grove, which, will, um, which was once just an amazing uh, commercial street will be back again, you know, and we're going to, we're going to, you know, the entire fabric of the community will be vibrant. So this, this is not just a life science campus. This is an entire uh, mixed use ecosystem, um, but with a focus on jobs, right? Because we think jobs, jobs, jobs create uh, the pathway to everything else on the site. Yeah, no, it, it's, Absolutely right. And the long term view that you've both just mentioned, Jim, in particular, you kind of mentioned that this is a long term project that, you know, COVID is not really slowing you down because you've got the chance to develop this going forward. I think a lot of uh, observers of real estate sometimes think, you know, the market is what it is today. This is a long term vision. Very clearly, I brought up the, the rendering of the site plan also because we've seen a lot of audience questions just while we've been going in terms of access and just a, a physical view of the site. So I'm hoping this this image helps a little bit. Maybe Scott, you can kind of talk us through, you know, just talk us through what we're looking at here, what these boxes kind of represent, where the site is, what you see as the main access points, how you see it connecting to the community. Can you just, will this visual help you kind of just talk through it for some of the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, obviously it's a McCormick place on the, on the top of the screen there. Um, and, and we're, uh, there's a small, there's a small area between McCormick place and our site, which is currently privately owned, which we are um, interested in acquiring over time. Uh, those kind of uh, shadowed buildings on the right-hand side, the higher rise buildings, those are on the marshalling yards, which will be a later phase. Um, on the kind of the top of the brighter area, you can see the Prairie Shores development, which are five, uh, a, a five building apartment complex, which will be part of our TPD, but it's not part of the actual de the development. Uh, and then that little kind of area in between where you see kind of from the bottom heading to the, from the lower left to the upper right, you can see the buildings kind of graduate as we go. Uh, we are starting out, that's 31st Street on the bottom there, um, which uh, again, the city has spent some money already on a beautiful marina and harbor there. 
uh, it's it's we, we envision that being a very significant um, uh, commercial street going forward. Uh, the building, uh, you can see the Arc Innovation Building just, just above the arrow there, uh, the cursor. Uh, and that's where we're starting out. And, and we're starting down there for a few reasons. Uh, there's some environmental issues that need to be solved on the north before we can get there. But really, we're happy starting on the south anyways, because that really is the, the true gateway uh, into the entire Bronzeville community. And this, this I, I think I said it earlier, that this is intended to be, you know, open and, and, and welcoming arms and very pedestrian friendly and, and, and a gateway, you know, so many people, they live a couple miles away, they've never even been to the lake. So we're gonna create access to the lake over here and, and, and just create a very walkable, very livable, very, very green uh, community here. Um, over time, we will create ways to get over the tracks to connect the, the marshaling yards and all the way, in fact, to the lake shore. Um, uh, and, and the idea too is, is, is in full disclosure, we're part of the team that purchased the Prairie Shores apartment complex that I just mentioned. And a lot of the reason we did that is, is to make sure we had access um, off of Martin Luther King Drive through that complex and into our, into our development. You know, one thing, Christian, I'll add on to what, what Scott said is we just haven't seen a lot of nice, inclusive developments on the south side of Chicago, period. Big dollars just have not come there. And so when we look at this site and the 10 acres of open space, if you see renderings of this site, you see parks, you see grass, you see open space. The alderman was very focused on that. You see a quality of living and lifestyle that just does not exist on the South side. That my, my family was part of that great migration that came from Mississippi and Alabama into that community just a little bit West on 43rd and then Sands. And to Scott's point, when I was a kid, we lived right at Cottage Grove. My first job was on Cottage Grove. That was a robust, growing entrepreneurial area that was full of livelihood, just full. You know, the South Side now, you struggle to find a grocery store. When we talk about the illnesses of African-Americans, they can't get fresh food. Uh, they really are starved for so many things that on the north side you take for granted. That little beach there at 31st Street Beach uh, is a mecca. It's interesting that, 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 that we're there. That beach draws more people from the south side than any other beach. And in the summertime, you have thousands of people there just to get out, be in the beach, be along, and they can come across the street. So we're in an area, we're bringing things to the population around there and I think it'll be a magnet for folks that don't live around there. They just want to come there and experience something nice, which they don't get a lot of on the South Side of Chicago. You're absolutely right. Yeah, there's, we've actually done some studies on this. And when it comes to uh, standard consumer goods, you talk about groceries, retail, uh, clothing stores, and others, there's, there's essentially a four to one ratio, right? Increasingly a five to one ratio from North Side to South Side in Chicago. And uh, if this can address even a part of that, right, it, it could be a huge success because the demand is there. In every research study we've done, the demand is absolutely there for consumer goods and products on the South Side. It's just underserved. Um, I want to kind of continue on this topic while we've got the rendering up uh, of access. Since we talked about it, and it seems that you've got a, a very holistic plan to get kind of connectivity there. Let's talk about, though, uh, CTA access and things. Uh, One Central is planning to bring those into their project, which is just north of McCormick Place. For those who are not aware, it kind of starts up in this region, north of McCormick. But how do you get to this site? How would I get to this site, say, from downtown? So there's a there's a, a lot of discussion about that, right? So our site, you know, uh, assuming we, we get the um, Marshall Yard site done as well, um, we're bifurcated by the, the Metro Electric Line. Uh, we will be building a new metro station uh, that will span from 31st Street all the way to 29th Street. Uh, we are, uh, there's a lot, a lot of discussion with One Strength Central, ourselves, McCormick Place, and others uh, to activate the busway that, that goes all the way down to um, Millennium Park, and it's kind of a, a, a clear shot. Um, and then the CTA, obviously, you know, it, it, the, the transportation hub contemplated by One Central that would be just a boom to, to what we're trying to accomplish here that, especially with the Obama Presidential Center with, you know, their 
they're, they're double tracking the the South Shore line all the way to South Bend. I mean, through Michigan City, and and, and so you know the the connectivity on the South Side here from a uh, you know public transportation and mass transportation standpoint um, potentially you know is great. You know the the South the uh, Metro line, the electric line. Uh, we are talking to the RTA about. Uh, making that much more like a transit line as opposed to just a commuter line. So more more frequent stops, more more available stops, that type of thing that will really start connecting at the very least the presidential center, Hyde Park, our site, McCormick Place, one central and downtown. Fantastic. No, thanks a lot. I think because you know access is a critical issue both you know within the region, right, and for the community, but also for those coming from outside of the region to get to the project. So yeah. I've had several questions on that, and I'm, I appreciate you highlighting it. Last topic that I've got for you, because you mentioned the team nature of this project. Um, so I wanted to, to dive a little bit into that, and then we'll turn it over to more of the audience questions. But you mentioned the GRIT partnership. How are you guys structuring this partnership such that you've got investment and you've got weigh-in from the community and from others, but you don't have too many cooks in the kitchen? That's kind of a difficulty with some development projects. When you start to get too many partners uh, you, you don't get something done. How are you balancing that, right? With a lot of different opinions, but also making sure you're moving forward with your project. You know, it's so strange, Christian. We, we've never had other than just everybody agree on every single thing. I don't know, I don't know how that is. So it's been great. <laughs> really? Um, I believe you. <laughs> that actually, I mean, the truth is everybody, everybody's rolling from the same side. And, and, and you know, it's, uh, you know, obviously, you know, there are, there are things that have to get worked out, but we each bring a, a pretty interesting different set of skills to the table and that was you know as we put the team together that was the idea you know i think that um you know i can go right down the list you know from loop capital obviously you know their 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 breadth and in, in, in expertise in, in in the capital markets and, and the ability to uh help us understand all that and, and, and to accomplish that um you know, that's important from the beginning. It's going to become even more and more important as we get going now, as we get closer to our RDA, you know, um, uh, CNI, uh, Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives, you know, not-for-profit developer, you know, huge experience and in, 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 in expertise with A, dealing with the city and B, with infrastructure issues um, as, as we go. You know, the um, Brownsville Community Development Partnership, you know, fantastic with community engagement and, and you know, obviously, um, helping us understand the community better and, and work our way through that. And they bring a, a great deal of, of, they've been very active in, in, in the smart cities kind of initiative and also um, many of the renewable energy type things. So um, McLaurin development, a lot of engagement on the South side, um, you know, somebody we've worked with for a long time and know and trust, understand. Draper and Kramer, of course, you know, they are, they've been in this neighborhood longer than, you know, longer than, uh, you know, I think, I think they're a 130 year old development firm. Um, you know, they built Prairie Shores, you know, 60 some years ago. Um, so I, I think that um, everybody, everybody brings an opinion, everybody brings some extra expertise. You know, um, I, I think, you know, uh, Farpoint, you know, we get to live and breathe and work at every single day. You know, we have an entire staff dedicated to it on a full-time basis. And, um, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, and that's just part of the team, right? As I mentioned before, between uh, communicating with the alderman's office, the mayor's office, uh, planning department, um, all these other outside members we brought in, uh, truly it's, it, it, it couldn't be moving forward without everybody. And uh, Christian, I'll quickly add something I alluded to early. I think that's incredibly important. Um, you know, the position that African-Americans sit in in this city in terms of the wealth gap continues to get wider, just gets wider. And the African-American engagement with projects like this in meaningful ways is almost non-existent. You know, I happen to be um, on the construction committee for the Obama Museum. And my instructions from the president himself was, Jim, make this transformative uh, project for our construction companies. And we were able to have African-American construction companies uh, do 51% of that construction. That's the largest that they've ever that they've ever been awarded for a project like that, and 49% to non-minorities. When we look at also, and I'll give credit to Scott for putting a team together because he brought me in, it was his idea. You know, he's got three African-American equity participants in this. 
I don't think any other development has any, any. And so when we think about a project like this in a community like this and the African-American engagement, involvement and the equity, I think that's very, very significant. Not just to what's gonna to happen to African-Americans that are participating, but all the way down. And it, in addition to the amazing leadership from Alderman King and the mayor's office, to the fact that we're at that table and all the money that gets spent, we get a chance to look at, um, take a really long-term view, approve and see where things go. So that makes a very big difference in this project. Yeah, it absolutely does. And unfortunately you're right in that it's completely unique, right? And that yes. many opportunities and investments, many projects around the country, even in opportunity zone areas don't have representation no. uh, in terms of equity and African-American investment. Actually, on that point, we've got a few questions from the audience. How do you think investors can be strategic in making sure that this is not the only project like this? And, that, and, and Scott, maybe you want to weigh in too. How do you think the best way to connect capital partners uh, who are African-American into projects like this throughout, throughout Chicago and throughout the country more broadly? Well, I'll start. Yeah, yeah, please. Scott, yeah, go ahead. ahead. Um, one, I think they have to look at opening up the, um, the sponsorship groups, the GP groups and just give you an opportunity to participate if you can. And I think that's what Scott did. I think that's what more need to do. I think by the time many African-Americans see these projects, the deal's already cooked with, with the GPs and you, you, there's no place for you. I think everyone that does a big project in the city needs to have a place for African-American, Hispanic engagement. If we're gonna impact this wealth imbalance that's taking place in the city and continues to get wider. There's really no better position than being in the equity at the table. In my infrastructure fund, we own 30 year leases at airport terminals. So we get a chance to take a look at every concessionaire that comes into that terminal. And we get a chance to make sure we get the balance that we wanna see with minorities coming to the table. If you're not in the equity, you know, you're really just almost waving at it and you're hoping to get the law guest and you're hoping that the political influence can uh, assist you, but it's, it's a different seat, a different vantage point that you're working from. Yeah, and I would just add yeah. that it's gotta be very intentional, right? It just, it just doesn't happen on its own. And, um, you know, equ equity, get, let, letting folks in the equity for sure um, but just making sure that there's, it's, it's, it's a, a matter of access, right? Just know, knowing what the opportunities are and having a gateway to get into them. Yeah, no, thank you both for bringing up that topic. There were a lot of questions on it from the audience and I think it's critical. Real estate, some people know, but many people don't, is a, is a clubby industry, right? Yeah. And um, it, it limited partners often invite uh, general partners often invite limited partners in just because they know them or their friends and family, and it's uh, the access is incredibly limited historically, and it's it's exciting to see the change you're making here with this project. Um, so, another question or series of questions have come in on housing. Though we've talked a lot about this project in terms of the healthy lifestyle, the arc venture, um, and the initial components, but there's a lot of concern and the questions on affordable housing on the south side. Do you have a, a component of affordable housing in this project? that you'll be working with? Do you have any housing in this project that you want to talk about or any residential component that you want to discuss? You know, the housing is, is uh, you know, most, most of this project is, is yet to be really designed and master planned. Um, the, uh, the senior housing uh, project that'll be part of the first phase is the only one that's truly on the drawing board right now. Uh, but we do expect significant, you know, specifically multifamily housing as time goes on. And we've committed to 20% affordable uh, on site um, as it relates to the housing. Fantastic. No, that's that's helpful because we've got some questions in there. I think uh, my own perspective, you know, what Chicago really needs most is what I call real people housing. Mm -hmm. You know, 73% of residents make less than $75,000 a year, and there's not much housing designed for people in that bracket, right? A lot of the uh, multifamily projects that have come online over the last decade have been incredible but they've been um, really serving a small, small niche of the community, not, not the community at large. Yeah, and I, I just anecdotally, you know, we, as I mentioned before, we're part of the ownership group at, at the Prairie Shores apartment complex that we bought um, in conjunction with uh, Golub and Goldman Sachs. And we, 
uh, are fully committed there to, um, you know, 50% will be 8 to 10 AMI um, workforce housing over time. And in fact, the, um, as, as we're going through the redress of the units right now, uh, we're, we're proud to say that um, in excess of the 65% uh, is going to uh, minority um, firms right now in minority participation. So very proud of that. No, it's very helpful. I'll, I'll close with one, one or two more questions. And then uh, if there's anything else, Megan, we'll turn it back to you and, and Meredith. But in terms of the context of the city of Chicago, COVID-19 has demonstrated very clearly that Chicago has unacceptable disparities in terms of healthcare, in terms of access, in terms of wellness with the north side and the south side. You've got an opportunity here to really uh, change that. So how, how do you want this project to make Chicago a better place to live for all residents and for local residents and neighbors? I will, uh, I'll, I'll start then Scott, you can, you can pick it up. When you have a project of this magnitude, three to three and a half billion dollars over time, first of all, you've got to start with um, the work that gets done has to be by companies that own, that are owned by minorities. They, they just has to be. That's you, so you start off by transforming those companies. With that transformation of those companies, they hire more workers and that is really a, a fuel to, to how you do that um, from that point. But also you take another approach from the bottom up. The unemployment rate in that neighborhood, which is always on the South side period, is always hard to predict. I think the numbers are always understated. If you ask me the African-American unemployment rate you know, on the South side generally, I'd probably put somewhere in that 30 to 40% range, not someplace in the low, low double digits that, that we see nationally. We've got to pull people in and provide training for folks that really want to get trained to acquire the skills that they're going to need to be competitive in the job market. Being on the South side, you're right there where they live, which is very different than putting this far north, far west, out near the airport, et cetera. It's very easy to get to and the commitment is there. You know, I'm on the, I'm vice chair of the Chicago Community Trust and and, and narrowing that wealth gap is a big part of what we do, but uh, what we're focused on doing. Jobs, job training, uh, growing these businesses, which the growth in African-American businesses overall is abysmal. And it's going to take projects like this that are transformative in nature that's on publicly owned land to make sure that the Chicagoans benefit, particularly Chicagoans in that neighborhood, benefit from this significant development. If all we do here is develop this land and a few people make a lot of money, uh, that's, a, that's a total failure as, as near as I see it. Maybe some other developers might say, Jim, that's probably a really good deal, but it's a total failure when we look at what we could and should do for the African-American community in that neighborhood. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, Jim. I, I could not agree with you more, but you know, I think that where we find ourselves today in the just the cross crosshairs of being on just the perfect right place in history. You know, I think that when you combine things with this vacant site that shouldn't be vacant in 2021, available for development on the south side of Chicago, consistent with the mayor's Invest Southwest initiative, con consistent with the governor's Build in Illinois initiative, when we when we see uh, you know in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, that we get to address, you know, we, we've been talking about the health inequities for so long and, the, and the, the fact that, you know, if you're a guy like me born in Evanston, my life expectancy is 30 years longer than if I was born in Englewood. That's a, not okay. So we talk about fixing the safety net on the south side and, and really create creating access to all those things that give you, you know, life security, you know, obviously healthcare, but jobs and housing and, 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 and you know, place, places of security. That's that's what this thing is, and, and, and that's the opportunity we have, and we cannot do it alone. So, yes, we need to include everybody, but we're, you know, we are out actively seeking corporate partners now who, you know, this is obviously, you know, um, a, a very topical time to really be able to attract uh, dollars into these type of neighborhoods and these type of projects to benefit uh, the residents as, as they should, as they deserve. That's fantastic. No, thank you so much. Just in closing, I wanted to say thank you to both of you for taking the time today to talk to this project. I'm personally very excited for Chicago and for the South Side. You think just to the north of your project, you've got 
transformative transit hub coming at one central just to the west of your project you've got the 78 right which is bringing the discovery partners institute and then right in the in the in the heart of the city in bronzeville you've got this project transforming the, the community integrating with the community access to the lakefront and just a real opportunity for the south side of chicago so i, I wanted to thank you both for taking the time for kind of walking us through what you're proposing um any last comments or questions i'll turn it back to you meredith but uh Thank you again for everybody for joining as well. Thank you too. Thanks, Christian. Great job. <laughs> Good afternoon again, everyone. What a wonderful discussion we just heard. Please join me in a virtual round of applause for our fantastic panel. <laughs> I would also like to recognize and thank Alderman Sophia King of the Fourth Ward who joined us today. So we, we really appreciate you, have, you coming on the line as well. Um, I am fascinated by the trends we discussed and the equitable enhancement of economic and community life in our city's most distressed neighborhoods. I think we are all excited for your commitment to making Bron Bronzeville the health community of the future. We hope you found this information helpful and we really appreciate your participation. Please keep an eye on the Executives Club website for more upcoming virtual programs. In particular, we have one tomorrow at 11 o'clock at um, titled Talent Development, which is about the virtual onboarding during the pandemic. So you can sign up online at www.executivesclub.org. And we hope you have a great rest of the day and a very happy holidays with your family. So thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.